and uh, welcome to today's session of Digital Success Dialogue. Uh, today's topic, how you can get started with AI-driven performance marketing for your business. And we have with us today R.G. Isaac Matthew, CEO of Internet Tech Show and Digital Marketing University. And he will be joined in conversation with Chris Wexler, CEO of Krunum. Chris believes in technology for good and is fighting the distribution of child sexual abuse materials online. A super session today. Over to you, Aji. But before that, let's have a small video. Thank you so much, Ishani, and uh, welcome to all of you. And let's hope that today's session will add a lot of new dimensions in thinking about scale, not only at marketing, but also with respect to the operation, because that is something that we'll be talking to Chris. And uh, Chris, welcome uh, to the session. And uh, in it's, a last it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely, Chris. Thank you so much for taking time. And I'm sure uh, this new initiative that you're doing is 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 a is a very important part of making the web accessible to all. And as you said, technology for good is the need of the hour. Because when we have done technology, it it got people connected, uh, but also had its own cons to it. Uh, and it, it, it had, you know, the, the negatives which are as amplified as the positives are. So I'm sure that a lot of people don't understand the implication of the things that you're doing. So uh, I will request you to just explain what you do and how it makes a big impact in the society. And then we'll take the conversation from there. Absolutely. Well, first, thank you for having me on. It's uh, it's always good to have uh, great conversations with smart marketers and and people that care about the world. And so I really appreciate it. Uh, at Krunam, we started because uh, we realized technology could really be used to help children around the world. There, uh, in the last year, there were over sixty five million instances of child sexual abuse material that was discovered on open uh, web on websites like Facebook or Google or fill in the blank um, and uh, over 20 million different reports. So it, what we re what has become really clear to law enforcement and to um, uh, charity groups is that uh, the tools that all of us use every day to get through work and life um, predators are using to abuse and profit from the abuse of children. And every time one of these images gets shared, it, it's re-abusing this, uh, you know, amplifying the worst moment of this child's life. And so uh, it was a really, it, it's such a horrible um, thing that we, you know, we felt we needed to do something. And it was really AI and machine learning that could do something that could deal with the scale because 65 million um, images is a lot, but you're talking about sifting through trillions of images and videos. And so, you know, one thing uh, machines do very well is do repetitive work, do psychologically harmful work. It's hard to um, look at this stuff um, to do things fast and at scale so it doesn't interrupt, uh, you know, typical workflows. And so um, we, uh, our technology team did an amazing job of building a, a classifier that allows companies like a Microsoft, like a Facebook to, um, to scan images or videos before they get uploaded. Cause the typical flow in a user generated, uh, situation is it gets uploaded, it gets put up, somebody sees what the offending content is, says, hey, this isn't good. So maybe 10, 100,000 people see it. Right. Then it goes to a human moderator that uh, that then has to look at it again to go, yep, that's that's violating our terms of service. And then they take it down. Well, that's a lot of human contact. And those 
poor um, content moderators, that's a really hard job. Like it, right. it's, uh, you know, the typical length of time that you can stay in that job is about six to nine months just because it's so emotionally draining and damaging. Um, and so our, our algorithm, our classifier allows, uh, takes humans out of the equation and allows the machines to do what they do well. And so it's, uh, it's an exciting leap forward because the technology currently that's available only can identify what is unknown, but because we're using computer vision and AI, we can literally discern patterns of behavior, patterns of who's in the, in the, in the uh, video or image, uh, relative ages to really understand what's going on and pull that out before anybody has to see it, which is really good. Absolutely. And, and I believe that, you know, the, the days to come, the communities, within a brand will also become a, a very important part of your marketing and uh, communities will only thrive if the communities are open and you have user generated content being allowed so is is your tool only for large companies or even smaller brands who want to use it they they will have a plugin which can be connected and they can also use it yeah any any company that holds uh the public's data um, right. can use our classifier. And so what's, uh, it, it, what's great about that is it takes the pressure off of having to hire people to, to manage that. Right. Um, and, uh, and, you know, whenever you have an online community, I think we've focused so much in the last 10 years of building scale, getting a lot of people in there, making sure. it really easy to share, make it seamless. Like all that is really good, like digital best practices. Um, However, like the next and I think harder step is how do we make those communities healthy and how do we make those communities not harmful to the people in the community? So not right. just not just uh, child sexual abuse materials or CSAM, but um, even uh, threats or incitement to violence or fake news, like all these things are damaging. Um, right. We've seen a lot of that in, uh, in during the pandemic where people are spreading rumors or lies that are actually hurting people. Um, all those things, um, AI and machine learning have a, and deep learning have a real great potential to help combat and make communities more, uh, less harmful because there's right. huge positives for digital communities, but we're starting to see the real impact of the negatives. Oh yeah, absolutely. When you said about positive, uh, you know, in my early days, we used to run some of the largest communities in us in the financial sector and uh, you know the, the 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 help from one person to the other was so beneficial in the community and when whenever we used to get depressed we will go and read the testimonials that other people have written so many people who decided that my finance was in really bad uh, terms and i wanted to end my life and they used to come to our community they used to get help from other community members that wow. how they have done this whole fighting and how they have won over their uh, debts and everything. And you know that, that whole community bonding was so wonderful. And we had uh, at that time, you know, over a kind of a half a million kind of people who were helping each other with uh, the, the you know, finance related communication and debt consolidation and those kind of help. Uh, so the power of community, and we always used to say that you can beat a product, you can beat a pricing, you can beat a service, but you can't beat a community. So mm -hmm. any brand which has the community will win over other people who do not have the community. So I think, you know, That's a product exactly like right. yours will help them to build the communities without the worry of what happens when somebody spams, uh, you know, to that large level, uh, which is going to hurt. Yeah, exactly right. I, I mean, the power. I mean, right now we're 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 in different sides of the globe, and we're talking to to your audience. I mean, the power of connection online is so important. Um, but the same power can scale things that you know we as a society don't want scaled, and so. Uh, but that's really hard to manage, and so I, I think I've uh, always in my career, I always run at hard problems, maybe to my detriment, but um, I like solving hard problems. And so uh, that's one of the one of the reasons uh, we're truly excited about what's happening at Krunam. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, just one of the areas that I am always interested in is when I started the company, it took me almost eight to nine months to get a company name, which everybody agreed on. Okay, so whenever we'll come up with a, and uh, 
for first nine months, we did not even had a company name. We were running without a company name. So how did you come to the name Krunam and what does that mean? Does it have a meaning? How do you, how do you come to a company name? Was it selecti selecting a name a hard uh, decision? Was it easy to come by? Yeah, naming is always so difficult, particularly yeah. uh, when you have to factor in that you need to get a uh, URL, right? <laughs> URLs are, are, are getting gobbled up left and right. Um, what was interesting is we kept going back to the core of who we were and uh which was you know trying to save kids and uh and scale that and we went we went back we kept going well you know it's kind of like this it's kind of like that you kind of look at analogies and we played with shield or defender or you know kind of these things but not all of them felt a little wrong and weird we had to do it quickly too we we were uh, about to launch and we realized the name that we had uh was gonna not work uh globally and so we had to fix that and so uh, we went to our inspiration, which is uh, there's this woman in uh, northern Thailand named Kru Nam, two words, Kru Nam. And uh, she was a street artist in Chiang Mai. And uh, she was very successful. She was doing very, very well. Um, she did a project with the street kids, um, teaching them to paint. And go, she just goes, just paint your life. And then she couldn't believe the horrors that they were painting. And she realized that a lot of the um, businesses along her stretch of the road were actually fronts for um, child brothels. And so unlike, I think, me and 99.9% .9 of the other people in the world, um, she didn't go, oh, that's horrible, and, and kind of move on with her life. She just started walking in and taking the kids until she had 20 kids in her apartment. Um, and then the, the traffickers literally came to her and said, we're going to, we'll kill you if you do this again. So she got out of town. She went, um, up to the Northern part of, um, Thailand and create, started a community. Uh, and since she's constantly evolved her methods, got better at what she's doing. She's now saved thousands of non-state children in, in Thailand. In fact, one of the first kids she pulled out, uh, of uh, off the streets in Chiang Mai, just graduated from college and university. Uh, one of the first non-state children in Thailand to do that. And so she's such an inspiration to us. Um, we asked her if we could name the company in honor of her. Plus, as a digital marketer, I loved it because the URL was available and SEO was really clean and uh, and it, it sonically sounds really well. So she had the perfect name for us. And so we're, we're, we're excited and honored to, uh, to, uh, be na uh, to be named after an amazing woman. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it solves a purpose and it honors somebody who has done the work and hopefully technology will scale her dream to a next level altogether. So it, the story continues and, and technology continues the whole story. And, and over there, you know, that the technology that you're using right now with various technology stack, and I'm sure that this problem existed for many years, but it was very difficult to solve if we did not had machine learning, AI. It's so difficult to, you know, have a human layer in between to do this because the, the scale is massive. So you know, how do you approach this with an uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence? Uh, where where do you start? Uh, are there some kind of you know technology stack that you you have in place that you want to talk about? Well, I think the and, and this is just kind of a universal lesson around AI and machine learning. You're only as good as your data. Um, right. Data is always the issue. Uh, even going back to like old direct marketing days, your your list matters, then your offer, then you know, then you're creative, you know, uh, right. but the data really mattered. And so that was something that um, our CTO and co-founder, Scott Page and Ben Gantz, they were working with um, the UK home office. And uh, they had put together about three or four years before a unified database of confiscated materials. Uh, the problem with CSAM is you're, no private company, no one's allowed to hold this data. It's illegal data to hold. And mm -hmm. so, uh, but because Ben was a, uh, was a uh, previous investigator of child crimes, um, they did a pro bono project where they literally went in and went, I wonder if machine learning can help. 
and help understand and, and identify this. So we literally had to drag our equipment into, a, uh, into, the, into the offices of the police. And then, and this was back in 2015, I believe, 16 maybe, um, and then see if computer vision and machine learning was actually sophisticated enough to do this. You know, facial recognition is something that people know about in, right. uh, in this. And it ha it's problematic. It makes mistakes all the time. And it's seen millions of faces to learn. Right. What, we were, what we're asking uh, deep learning and machine learning to do is to, uh, to look at intention of behavior based on p body positioning, based on who is in the image. We were asking it to do a little more sophisticated work. Um, and so the question was, could that even happen? And so taking the very cutting edge of computer vision and uh, machine learning, we, we put it on an amazing data set that was curated by law enforcement and found that, yes, indeed, we can get there and then have refined it over the years. Um, and so I think the most critical element of that, though, is the data set that's not only collected, but is finally labeled and right. properly labeled by by uh, by people that are highly trained. I think a lot of um, AI and machine learning uh, has a has a data cleanliness problem. And anyone who's tried to do a big data problem, you're like, well, the calculations won't take long, but it's going to take us months to get the data clean enough to do something with. And so, you know, it takes me. It took me back to my marketing uh, marketing communications tech days where we would work really hard the most the 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 earliest decision is the one that impacts you months and months and months if not years down the road of how right. do you label your data how do you label your performance data so that you can parse it later you can pull it apart and find the trends right. um too often we don't worry about that until it's too late and then your data is a mess and so having really Having this, the you know, the with the UK Home Office having the foresight to really uh, pull this data together in a, in the right way, um, has allowed us to really push push the boundaries of computer vision um, to help kids, which is great. Right. So you know, like uh, as entrepreneurs, we are generally very impatient, right? So we want to see the things, and especially if you are making a product, you want to see it going live. And uh, especially with the data labeling, you, it, it must have taken you a lot of time. So how did you monitor your progress, whether you are in the right track? Had, did you ever have a kind of a self-doubt? Are we on the right track? Should we speed this up? Is, are we all doing OK? So how do you motivate yourself that we are on the right track? Well, it's interesting. You know, the, one of the reasons Kurnam is here is really to scale the solution. And so it was originally designed for law enforcement, to help law enforcement, because um, there are very few investigators that are looking at um, sexual crimes against children. And a lot of the time that they spend is literally uh, is literally going through confiscated materials to see if the perpetrator that they found is, is vi has violated the law. And so we saw almost immediately in that sphere uh, that, uh, that it sped investigations and actually saved kids. And so that's a pretty strong motivation that literally we saw kids pulled out of, um, uh, out of, it, it freed up investigators to free kids. And so that's a good, that, you know, I, I, on an emotional level, that's great. Uh, what we found is it's really difficult as a market to sell into law enforcement. There's, it's just not, um, there's not a lot of money there. There's not a lot of, uh, not a lot of investigators doing this work. And so that's why we pivoted to start bringing this out to the um, online communities of the world, uh, because uh, when we're dealing with, you know, communities at scale in India, in the U.S., in uh, in Asia, uh, in Southeast Asia, that's really, you know, we, we can start um, uh, moving up, up the data stream to where they find these images and just stop them at their source. And so... Uh, that was, I think, the most impatient moment was we're like, oh, we need to get this this technology to more people. And we realized we had to kind of reformulate how we did the company to do that, which, you know, that's an entrepreneur's job is to kind of figure out what's the next step. Right, right. And uh, so since your background is also into marketing and performance marketing and on the operations side, you're dealing with 
uh, AI, machine learning. So, you know, in, in marketing also, now we see that marketing is primarily driven by uh, AI in many sense. Like we don't have to manage the campaigns the way we used to manage the campaigns previously. So what do you... What do you see for a performance marketing with respect to AI? Do you see major changes happening in that? What's your take on that? Yeah, I, I think the the most exciting part of AI and performance marketing is bridging the gap um, and elongating our understanding of the impact of marketing. I think um, I, I'm lucky enough or old enough, one of the two, I guess that's lucky, to uh, have been doing this since the very, almost the very beginning of performance marketing. I remember explaining to my clients what a cookie was, and now I'm old enough to have watched the death of cookies. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, but, uh, you know, it, at, the, at the very beginning, we were so excited. Oh, we can see when somebody clicked where they went on your website. Oh, this is so cool. Um, but what we found when we, as we did it more and as we did this, that there were marketing outcomes that were happening that didn't match the very nearest term data. And so sometimes a click isn't all that indicative. Sometimes it's more important to measure if somebody's seen something. Sometimes it's more important to see if they've engaged for a certain amount of time. And so, you know, over the years, we as digital marketers got more and more uh, savvy on what really mattered as far as a success metric. Well, I think the next stage, particularly with AI, is I think we'll be able to calculate more of a lifetime value of performance marketing. And I think that that's the exciting part of it is um, I think there's been a real conflict between performance marketers and brand marketers. And I was lucky enough to work for a lot of the um, you know premier brands in the world leading uh, digital marketing for uh, Harley Davidson or their agencies, Harley Davidson or Microsoft. Um, and so like large global rollouts, right. And, uh, every year I'm like, I wish I knew what I knew last year. And so that that's kind of how it always is. Right. Um, but when you work on those big brands, you're worried about where your ads are running because you don't want it to be in a spot that will damage the brand. And so I've been worried about, I was been worried about brand safety for years and years and years. Um, but the other thing, you know, we had, you know, either large television or out of home, uh, you know, billboards or fill in the blank. And I think as we were able to get more data on, the holistic business, we were seeing how those things work together really well. Uh, Granger was a great example that um, it's the, uh, I think, eighth or ninth largest uh, e-commerce platform. And it's all, you know, uh, businesses, B2B, you know, selling to people running factories and that kind of thing. Um, and when we ran radio that targeted those people, our conversion rates online went up. Uh, you know, I saw, I've, I've seen that with retailers. Like when you run a television ad, all of a sudden you look brilliant in your paid search, all right. these things interconnect. Um, and it's, it's on such, uh, a mass level, but a micro level of like that, that, uh, television ad might increase your digital performance marketing by that much. Um, and the only way you're going to ever quantify that is at mass scale of data, to go, okay, if you run these two together and, and we have four years of data, we see that there's gonna be this much of a lift in your performance marketing. And uh, that's the exciting future, I think, is we'll understand how they work together. Um, yeah. And as a result, uh, make them work a lot more efficiently. Right, and, and with digital marketing, because of the KPIs and because of the data which is available, so sometimes we go overboard with tracking and looking at the data. So when I work with the project, I tell them, that I am doing A and I'm doing B and I'm also praying for you. As long as any of <laughs> thing is working, you should be happy about it. Don't think about, you know, whether A is working or B is working or prayer is working. As long as your top business is winning. So that's the point number one. And point number two is getting details into the data. Sometimes this data tracking can, you know, like uh, it's, it's very difficult to integrate all of this data together at times, which can make sense. And not everything makes sense can be trackable. And sometimes what is trackable does not make sense either. So in that way, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult challenge in the era of data and tracking and everything. 
uh, and you're overwhelmed with the data. I mean, KPIs altogether. Yeah, exactly right. I th I do think, yeah, you, you mentioning that there's just too much measured. I think that's exactly right. I think, uh, you know, as uh, getting your data clean is one thing, but also really understanding your goals is yeah. really important. And I think too often we look at everything and go, well, all those are good, but what about that? Um, when that doesn't matter. Um, and so agreeing on that early is really important. Like this is success. This is what it looks like. Um, and uh, I think too often that doesn't happen in in, in digital marketing because we think about what, oh, we can look at this and that and like it doesn't really matter. Like that is not something that's driving your business. I think that also the over-focus on near-term metrics sometimes hurts brands too. I've seen that where, you know, the performance marketing team is killing it but as a result, they're alienating X amount of people. And when I say they, I mean, that was an experience I did. I had like, I, I was, I did a great project for Harley Davidson, but it was annoying the other half of people that didn't like it. Um, and that hurt us in the long term. So we actually had to lower our performance marketing uh, goals because we saw the negative impacts elsewhere. And I think that's the other thing AI is going to help us with. Right, right, right. And and that's an area where I think there are a lot of honest conversations are required between all the teams where uh, both the teams does not have to justify whether their work is great, not great. Uh, but, you know, like looking at a oh, impact, not only from a short term, but also from long term perspective. Exactly. Uh, and, and because the integration of everything makes a lot more sense rather than working in silos for sure. Uh, exactly. It's just uh, not easy to do. It's difficult, but, it, and it, 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 and it's worth the investment of time. Uh, I've seen it over and over. It's worth the investment of time to do that. Absolutely. And, and see, one of the challenges that we are all facing is, you know, the, the ever changing technology where you need new brains to come in and look at how the technology work. And on the other side, you have people who have more maturity at a business level who does not understand the technology. Okay, And now who will drive it, who will take care of it, and how can a mature person work with a person who understands the technology so that both the things can work together is a challenge in itself. And uh, just taking one point from there is when you hire people, because hiring in itself is a complicated uh, scenario, especially when you're working in a new technology and uh, new uh, innovation altogether. So what do you look at when you hire people? Is, is there something specific that you're looking at? Uh, interestingly, th there's a couple things that um, I pr probably aren't what you might expect. I look for two traits. One is, um, are they self-driven? Are they self-motivated? Because I'd much rather say, hey, stop working so hard than begging them to work. Uh, you can't really train that. That is what it is. But the other one is I look for kind of a spirit of, of uh, curiosity and learning. I want them, when they see something weird, to go, why is that? And let's figure out why that is. Like when the data doesn't match what they expect or uh, when uh, a result comes back and it doesn't make sense, they don't just go, oh, well, that didn't work. They go, why didn't it work? Um, and I look for examples of that in their past. Everything else can be trained. Uh, like you, you be, and I, I obviously love it when somebody comes in with a technical skill that I don't have or the team doesn't have. That's always great. Um, or a background that we don't have. So like bringing in, like particularly in ad agencies, typically, at least in the U.S., I don't know how it is uh, there, but um, we tend to hire our own. Like, oh, you've been in an agency? That's great. Um, I, I actually liked bringing in people that hadn't been in the agency world uh, because they brought a different perspective that really helped us understand what our blind spots were. And so having kind of a diversity of backgrounds and thought um, was really critical as well. So right. curiosity and uh, this a unique background was always good for me because then we then we could get people working together. Then our job was to train them on how we like to do things, but then have them impact how we do things and make it better. And, and that's how it, it, over the long term, it made us a much stronger organization. Right, right. Just taking one pointer from there, uh, since right now, because of COVID, the whole education system is disrupted in many ways. Okay, And right now in India also, we are having this conversation whether you know the, the 12th standard exam should be done or should not be done because oh, of sure. the COVID. Yeah, and, and, and on the other side, 
you know you have a industry which where people are not looking at uh, the you know education as we used to look at in the past uh, and you are looking at people who are problem solver who, who are curious is there anything that the education industry should do uh, where this curiosity problem solving these things are a little more encouraged uh, do you have any pointers because end of the day that is something that is the need of the era yeah i i i I, you know, as a, as someone who likes to solve problems, I've looked at the educational system and right. thought, boy, there's, it's one of the few industries that are doing things almost the exact same way as they did it a hundred, 120 years ago. Um, you know, uh, and it seems like a spot that's ripe for innovation, but it's actually really difficult. Um, I would love, I would I, I would have appreciated more in my background uh, in school, less rote memorization and uh, and uh, facts, as in how to discern what a fact was, like th more systemic thinking than more um, kind of memorization and, and rote um, education. Obviously, there's a need for some of that, but um, educating uh, the next generation on how to identify uh, what is and what isn't real, what is and what isn't, um, factual, what is and what isn't, uh, legit. Like, so just basic statistics should be a much earlier, um, spot in the educational stack because you're able to look at something and go, you know, that's your play. You know, I, I believe, uh, uh, Mark Twain said there are lies, damn lies and statistics. Um, right. and so, you, you know, understanding how to see through that is really critical. And so I wish, I, I do think the educational system needs to more move to more systemic thinking. I think there's small steps going that way. Um, and it would help because, you know, we're obviously having to teach a lot more in our educational system than even 20 years ago. Um, thinking, teaching systemically is one way to kind of scale learning as well. Cause you're thinking frameworks of thinking versus, you know, facts. And that's a really critical um, evolution that I think uh, could be really helpful in in, uh, in educational circles. Absolutely. So uh, I'm aware of the time that we just have another five minutes uh, available with us. Um, you know, in the last point is that as entrepreneurs, as business leaders, we all need to keep ourselves updated. And, uh, and this last one year, I have seen the amount of knowledge which everyone has shared online, the podcasts, the you know the things which are available. Uh, so that there's overwhelming data which is available for entrepreneurs and business leaders or anybody who wants to learn. So, what are your favorites? Uh, do you have some favorite books, podcasts where you keep updating yourself? Yeah, um, the, my, my favorite book um, in the space of marketing is by Byron Sharp. It's called How Brands Grow. Um, you know, you talked about uh, the data and how sometimes it just doesn't make sense. Right. Um, when I read How Brands Grow and I read a, another paper he did called The Long and the Short of It, all of a sudden, some of that, those, the data, uh, weird data I saw made more sense to me because it kind of show it, it, it's an academic, but it's, it's an easy read, but it's an academic look at how people actually think about brands. Um, and so when you understand kind of what really drives performance and it's a data-driven book, um, it all of a sudden opens your eyes to, oh, I need to become, I, I don't need just to get their attention right now. I need to get into their memory. That's a very right. different task, right? And so um, that one was really a, amazing kind of, I was trying to make sense of the world and when I read that, it all, it all of a sudden made a lot more sense. So I'd highly recommend uh, How Brands Grow by Byron Sharp as well as uh, the, uh, the paper out there, the, the long and the short of it. Uh, in the podcast world, I've been, I'm, a, I'm a bit obsessed with behavioral economics books at, or podcasts. So, you know, whether that be a Freakonomics or, um, you know, uh, uh, the I'm trying to remember the name of it now. Ah, anyway, uh, there's another great one by um, on uh, National Public Radio uh, here, The Hidden Mind um, or Hidden Brain. Um, it's what it looks at is how the wiring in our brains sometimes isn't that logical. I think 
the the brilliance of behavioral economics is that it looks at you know all of economics and frankly all of performance marketing which i was living in for years is built on people are logical and they make logical choices and the truth is our brains don't always make logical choices you know and um understanding better how that works is really key and this all goes back to another book that i love which is um uh, Danny Kahneman. Um, I'm trying, oh my gosh, I can't remember the name of it now. That's embarrassing. Anyway, um, but uh, anything by Daniel Kahneman, kind of the grandfather of of behavioral economics. Uh, it's a really critical way to understand human behavior uh, and uh, understand it on a level that is uh, acknowledges that we're not perfect, that we have weird ticks in how we think. Um, and, and not to use them to trick people, but to understand really what motivates people. Um, and I think that that's a, the, that's a critical space that if I would encourage anyone to kind of dive into behavioral economics. Absolutely. And that, that certainly, you know, uh, aligns with uh, rather than looking at tactics, look at the foundation of it and tactics will keep on changing. But end of the day, the foundations will uh, remain very, very strong. And yeah. uh, as long as you go back to the foundation, you will always remain a good marketeer. Uh, whether the cookie remains or cookie goes away, but still the marketeer inside us can survive and we can all continue to do good. Uh, so that's there. So there is a question um, by Zion. Find the right communication remains the biggest challenge for every marketeer. Do you think AI bots will replace copywriting? How excited are you about AI in content field? Any solution you recommend us to watch out for? from an AI perspective, because I've heard AI doing movie scripts, uh, AI doing a lot of advertisements now. Uh, so what is your take on that is the question from Simon. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's kind of amazing what's happening in the natural language processing space. Um, yeah. I do think, um, I always talk about marketing as kind of a dumbbell. It's, it used to be all together, right? But now we're seeing performance marketing becoming much bigger and kind of going but then i think brand marketing is still going to be critical long term um and so i think that the some of the ai driven uh copy i think will be really important in kind of what i call algorithmic creative um we started playing with that at my last firm of hey let's do a million versions of this banner and have the AI optimize it based on background colors, background, um, what, what's the headline, you know, so instead of, you know, doing AB testing, we're doing a, Z, a through Z testing. I think that that's coming. Um, you need to have a lot of scale to do that well, but I do think that's coming and I think that will be great. I still think we'll need amazing copywriters. Um, I think sometimes uh, that human uh, touch will be um, that will never go away or it will, it will take years and years for that to go away if that's the case. Absolutely. Absolutely. If I add what you said initially that, you know, on one side we take logical discussion decisions, but on the other side, we are still emotional human beings. And according to some statistics, we still take 70% of our decision emotionally. So yeah, as long do, as yeah, exactly. <laughs> so as long as that emotional part is there, there is always somebody who can write emotional copies, which may not come from a data, but it might come from your gut feel, your hypothesis, and then that starts working. And then of course the AI can pick it up from there. So it's going to be a combination of who initiates the copy and then who scales the copy to a different level. So I'm that's a good point. That's a really good point. And you know, AI is inherently backwards looking. It's yeah. only looking at the data that has been out there. So a new idea could be exactly what you need and AI will never find that new idea. It might find new right. combinations, but it won't find something truly new. Right. So on the technology level, I'm always scared to say that, you know, whether it's going to happen or not happen because uh, you know, uh, the, the things can change anytime. And thank you so much, Zain, for asking the question. And I, I think that's where we are. Uh, we'll not take further questions because we are already running short of time. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, for taking your time and uh, sharing the thoughts with us. And I'm sure that the initiative that you have taken will make the internet a far safer place and better place so that more people can be accommodated. And uh, I wish you all the best for uh, your venture. And and I'm sure sooner or later, I'll see you on the billionaires list and uh, <laughs> waiting, waiting for an autograph where you have changed the world for good. 
and of course the return comes in in some format or the other all right Thank well, I, I really appreciate you uh, having a really great, uh, interesting chat, and uh, I hope it was helpful for your audience. Uh, uh, just keep curious and uh, and keep trying to learn, and uh, everybody will do. You know, everybody will get better. So, thank you so right. much. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us. Thank you.